from the Acadiana Center for the Arts, a candidate's forum in the race for Louisiana's third congressional district, presented by the University of Louisiana at Lafayette's College of Liberal Arts, AOC Community Media, the Acadiana Center for the Arts, and KATC TV3. Our moderator for tonight's forum, KATC's Jim Hummel. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Hummel, coming to you live tonight from the Acadiana Center for the Arts in downtown Lafayette. For the next hour, right here on KATC, we have a forum for the candidates in the race for the third congressional district seat. This forum is being presented by us here at KATC, AOC, Community Media, the Acadiana Center for the Arts, and UL's College of Liberal Arts. Now, joining us on stage tonight, we have three of the four candidates. Uh, to my left right here, we have Braylon Harris, a Democrat who's in the race. In the middle, we have Brandon Lelou, the Libertarian candidate. And at the far end of the stage, we have Democrat Rob Anderson. We thank them all for being here tonight. As you know, there are four candidates, though, in this race. The incumbent, Congressman Clay Higgins, has declined our invitation to attend tonight's forum. He has, however, committed to a debate on KATC should this race go to a runoff. Now, because of the pandemic, the only people here inside the Moncus Theater at the ACA tonight, besides myself and the candidates, are a few campaign staff members and also the production crew who are helping us put on this, this forum tonight. And the stage, by the way, has also been set up to comply with CDC guidelines on social distancing. We will meet the candidates in just a moment, but first, let's talk about the format of tonight's forum. Each candidate will have a chance to introduce themselves to you at home. They will have one minute for opening statements and then closing statements at the end. Tonight, we have at least nine questions on important issues affecting Southwest Louisiana. The candidates will answer each question, but we will change up the order as we go as to who answers the question first. We'll give the candidates one minute and 30 seconds for their responses. Now, if a candidate is directly challenged by another, they will be given an appropriate amount of time to respond. And if time allows, we will have a lightning round of questions where we're looking for quick responses. And with that out of the way, let's meet the three candidates taking part in tonight's forum. First up, Mr. Braylon Harris, you have one minute. Absolutely. We are so glad to be with you all here at KATC as well here in the Acadiana Arts Center. We are grateful to be here in the great city of Lafayette as well, and we thank each and every one of you all for tuning in uh, to this District 3 Congressional Debate. We want you to know that today is a very important day. This is an interview day for who is going to be the ambassador of recovery for our district and our region. I challenge each and every one of you all to listen well to the rhetoric that we will speak on today. But after the rhetoric is over, do your best to check the resumes as well, the records as well as the references of each and every one of us. And I believe what you will discover is the young boy from De Quincey, Louisiana, who lives in Iowa, Louisiana, whose home is destroyed, but who has been working in the community for over 10 years, is the candidate of choice. All right, Mr. Harris, thank you. Mr. Lulu, you have one minute. All right. First, thank you so much for having this and giving us a chance to have our voice out here and field important issues through this forum. Uh, I'd like to say I'm the Libertarian candidate for House of Representatives. Uh, and if you don't know a whole lot about Libertarianism, the main ideals of it are individual liberty, free markets, and non-aggression, which is basically you don't aggress on others unless they do the same to you. Uh, I'm not a politician. I'm never going to be a politician. This is not a path I really ever saw myself coming down, but it's something I felt I had to do. This is something I felt like I owed it to my children and their children. I wanted to make a real difference in our state, in the country, and in the world if possible, just getting this message of liberty out of there. Uh, and, you know, if I could, I would take this position voluntarily. That's how much this means to me. Uh, and yeah, I just want to be here to protect the liberties that our country was enshrined with. All right. Thank you, Mr. Lulu. And over to you, Mr. Anderson. You have one minute. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, I am Rob Anderson, and I'm going to use my intro in a little bit of a different way. As Jim pointed out when we started, there are four people on the qualifying ballot for the U.S. House of Representatives in LA03. Three of them showed up. 
and we know who's missing. So I want to point out, having done this before, as many of you know, out there especially, I did this in 2018. So I want to point out how patriotic and how brave these guys are for getting up here and doing this. This is not as easy as it looks. And so for it, it calls into question our own congressman, who wasn't invited at the same time we were a month and a half ago or so, to not be here, to, you know, issue a challenge and then fail to stand behind his own words. So uh, my name is Rob Anderson. My uh, platform was all the way out there, so that's all I wanted to use my time for. All right. Gentlemen, thank you. Now let's get to our main questions, and we start with a question tonight about the federal hurricane response in southwest Louisiana. Many parts of the region have been devastated by Hurricanes Laura and Hurricane Delta. Has the federal response, in your view, been enough? What do you think is still needed, and how would you help as a congressman? Mr. Harris, you'll go first. You have one minute and 30 seconds. That, that's a tough one in 90 seconds. But um, here, here's what I want to be able to say very quickly. Uh, very early on uh, in, my college age, in my college experience, graduating from De Quincey High, going to Xavier University uh, in New Orleans, getting blown out by Katrina, coming to McNeese and then getting blown out by Rita, but still completing my business administration degree at McNeese uh, in 2008, I have been through twin tragedies before. And I have adjusted my life immediately after them, did make, made sure that we did an after action review. And I'm more able to face these twin tragedies that I face having been living in Iowa and having uh, 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 Laura and then of course mm -hmm. next having uh, Delta. I've made adjustments in my life to be able to uh, address those things. And so I think the, the federal government has failed in its after action review of both Katrina and Rita uh, and is lacking in its response because of the lack of uh, after action review of how it's responding to Laura and Delta as well. Uh, we need housing. Uh, we need temporary housing on the ground immediately. I am hopeful that the uh, congressman that is not here today is using his car salesman skills of his past to negotiate for uh, temporary housing and FEMA trellis. Uh, those are things that we need in Lake Charles and Southwest Louisiana on today. We're doing the very best that we can to feed everyone. We're doing the best we can to clean up extraordinary efforts from both local government as well as local agencies. But we need federal help, and we need it now. Okay, Mr. Lulu, same question over to you. Uh, has the federal response been enough? Do you think anything is still needed? What, what could you do to help? Okay, well, first off, I'd like to say I'm a huge advocate of free markets. And this whole experience has been a perfect example of why free markets are generally always superior to government action. I know that's not the case of what we're working with. We have the federal government set up the way it is. So before I jump back into that, I would like to say what I would like to see from the federal government would maybe be more coverage of the severity of the damage of the area. Getting out there, really showing people how devastated all these areas are. There's not a home that escaped without damage. You know, businesses are going to be shut down for months on end after already enduring this lockdown that was forced upon us. So now going back to the free market aspect of it. If you look at what's been going on, who were the first people out there? Who were the ones that were coming together to help everybody? It was charities, it was individual businesses. We had McDonald's in Lake Charles offering free food for the people of the city because it's a great PR for them. You know, it works out in everyone's favor. It feeds the people, it looks good for them. And where's the government been? There's debris everywhere which is what they're supposed to be responsible for picking up. Our streets and ditches are just chocked full of everything. And they just now got into town starting to offer assistance with roofing and that sort of thing. And I believe that overall the response has been a massive failure. Mr. Anderson, same question. How would you rate the federal response and what's still needed out there? Okay, thank you for that question. And. Uh, Listening to my two colleagues, I think there are elements of both that, that they uh, make good points. Uh, uh, to Mr. Uh, Harris's point, yes, this is Louisiana. We take care of each other, which leads into uh, Mr. Lou's point. The first people on the ground were the people themselves. Now, I don't consider that a free market argument because you're saying basically why the government sucks, and so therefore we shouldn't have a government, but that's a separate issue. I'm not attacking. He's allowed to rebut, but I'm not attacking, but I'm just saying. Yes, the uh, federal response in this instance was so far, and we know that because we live here. 
Uh, we see the debris piles. We see, uh, you know, our congressman wasn't even on the video of the, you know, of Trump coming down after Laura Scalise and John Bell Edwards were in the picture, and our own congressman was, at, you know, at the kids' table. So we don't have an advocate on the federal level who can get up there and caucus and raise hell and say, we need a federal response, and we need it now. This was a Category 5 storm. This was a once-in-a-century type event, and then it was immediately followed by another. So elements of both. Yes, we, Team Rubicon was the first uh, group I saw on the ground in Lake Charles, which is a nonprofit. But we are supposed to have FEMA trailers. We are supposed to have, uh, you know, uh, all of the assistance the federal government can bring in, ter in terms of troop and helping with sandbags because we were hit with an, immediately with another storm. And then a uh, key aspect of mine is infrastructure, which we'll get to later because I'm, I don't want to get the bell. Okay. Mr. Lulu, he did mention you by name. Was there anything you wanted to respond to there? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll take that up. My aspect of free markets operating in this is there are a lot of businesses going out of their way to be charitable and help the community, help pull together. You know, it's just non-government related assistance, mm -hmm. essentially. These are things that weren't, you know, forced or mandated. These were people of their own goodwill coming out of their way to do these and help the community. The community. It's Louisiana. That's what people do. Exactly. You know? Let's move on to the next question. Also on the topic of Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta, we, we heard a lot from the mayor of Lake Charles, Nick Hunter. He's repeatedly raised concerns about the rest of the country forgetting about southwest Louisiana. Now, if elected, what would you do to prevent that from happening? And how would you help the region get more assistance in the weeks and months and years ahead? Uh, Mr. Lulu, you're up first. You have a minute 30. Okay. I think one of the first things you can do is get cameras and feet and reporters on the ground any way you can. With the advent of social media, there's not that much of an excuse to not have coverage for stuff. It is unfortunate that the mainstream media seems to not be giving us a lot of support and attention for this. But this is another thing. Take it into our hands. Get on the ground. Get cameras. Show people just how serious this devastation is. You know, come up with proposals, with offers uh, of things, ways that businesses and charities can come in and assist with this. Uh, I think that's going to be one of the most effective ways to raise awareness for how serious this whole condition is because from what I've seen out of states is people have seen glimpses of coverage, but there's not much of an extent of the damage and how truly bad it was having them back to back. We've gotten a little more coverage because of mm -hmm. Delta, but I just don't think the full situation has been grasped and I feel like you know we could be doing more on our end as well instead of just depending on the national media. And I know Nick Hunter has really been working, trying to get out there and put the word out about how serious the situation is. Mr. Anderson, over to you. What would you do to keep the eyes of the nation on southwest Louisiana? When you first read that question off, the first thing I, I thought of was a quote was, uh, when in danger or in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. Uh, when you're getting attacked, when you're getting hurt, you, you raise the level uh, of noise. You call for help. You ask for it when you need to. Um, what my campaign has been doing since the beginning, obviously we are well known for having a massive social media platform, but I have been sharing that awareness because of that reason that we're not, they're not talking about us and I can't understand why, I'm telling you. This is a Category 5 storm. This is not just, oh, we had a storm come through. And I will, I hate to keep shouting out Mr. Harris because he, he is an opponent, but we share the same party in that he and I, uh, for sure, and I'm not saying you didn't, I just don't know. Uh, Mr. Harris and I have been on the ground, you know, getting stuff to people who need it. My campaign donated. He was running the program. Uh, but, you know, so we have been raising awareness and immediately went into uh, um, hurricane remediation mode, you know, getting people relief of what they need, water, food, batteries, any number of things, while at the same time blasting out constantly the media, who's you, by the way, so we should be yelling at you. Um, <laughs> Just trying to share it nationally. We're, you know, we're a small state. We're only 4.7 million, and unless we're not sending gas out to the rest of the country, a lot of times they don't pay attention to us down here. And I'm trying to change that. I'm trying to say, yeah, we're, we're people. We, we have a voice. 
You know, this news cycle that's out there, a lot of you are mentioning the media, it's crazy. It's 2020. Mr. Harris, how, how do you keep up with that? How do you keep the eyes of the nation on southwest Louisiana after these back-to-back -back hurricanes? Well, you know, I, I think first and foremost, let me commend our local government. They're doing a, a very, very great job with the lack of support from the federal government, mm -hmm. particularly our uh, congressman. Uh, and, and one of the things that I would not do is I would not add insult to injury. Uh, I would not be a distraction in this moment. Someone had even asked, what would I do in the midst of COVID? And so one of the questions, one of the thoughts is, I would say less and I would let the leaders lead. Uh, and so one of the things that we have from our recent congressman is many times he's distracting, our current congressman, he's distracting from the narrative rather than adding to the na narrative. What would I do? Number one, I would take the show on the road. I think it's very important for us to realize that we have evacuees, thousands of evacuees in New Orleans, thousands of evacuees in Houston, thousands of evacuees in Dallas, which are major metropolitan areas that have a much quicker and further reach as far as media is concerned. Uh, and so sometimes what you have to do is take the story on the road. Uh, so I would gather some of our leaders, begin to visit our evacuees, call for the local media in New Orleans, call for the local media in Houston, call for the local media in Dallas to meet us there. That, that would amplify our story. Con con concerning how would I keep the eye is I would continue to shape a new vision uh, for District 3, particularly Southwest Louisiana, put that in a marketing package, and again, take that show on the road in a, de in a desire to ensure that we are competing to win back every one of our constituents from where they are today. On to our third question now. Experts have been sounding the alarm about climate change for years. Warmer waters fuel more rapid intensification cycles for storms in the Gulf of Mexico, which we saw in both Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta. Do you believe this evidence? And what would you do as a United States congressman to mitigate the effects of climate change? Mr. Anderson, you're up first. Thank you, and thank you for that question. That leads me directly into my policies. Um, yes, I do believe we should listen to scientists. It sounds so bizarre to have to say that in 2020, but that's where we're at. Yes, I listen to experts. And the increased warming from the Gulf of Mexico, and we saw two bullseye within 10 miles of each other, the storm centers of our, of our city of Lake Charles. Uh, it's, it's here and it's real. Um, part of uh, my policy package is something we were going to launch, but they told me I couldn't use the art, so I'll save it for a press release tomorrow. But it's an infrastructure package, part of which mandates uh, carbon reduction uh, without affecting the oil and gas industry. Because there are new technologies coming out where you can do it in regular office buildings by monitoring climate controls, essentially, and reducing that carbon footprint. We can immediately lower the state of Louisiana by 25% in our carbon footprint, and we make money, get more jobs, and the oil and gas industry isn't affected in any way. So, to me, that's a no-brainer. I listen to experts, I listen to scientists, and I make my policies accordingly. Okay, Mr. Harris, over to you. Do you believe that evidence, and what could you do as a congressman to mitigate the impacts of climate change? Absolutely. I, I believe that we have to respond. Uh, to research, and, and we have to validate research. We cannot continue to educate our children and send our children to universities to be educated, to do research, and then uh, devalue that by not responding to it when it's, when it's there. That's someone's son, someone's daughter that they have invested a wealth of education in. Our universities and tax dollars have invested in them as well, and I believe they should be regarded and respected for the research that they do. Uh, so yes, absolutely. I think it's something that we must respond to. I think it's something we must respond to aggressively. We must understand that if those things are reality, and I believe many of them are, that we must make sure that as far as industry is concerned, that we're doing the very best we can to mitigate the problem as much as we possibly can. I come from, again, the southwest Louisiana area. My grandmother lived in Mallsville, where there was a ton of pollution, much cancer, different things along those lines that were there in the in, in that community. In fact, that community is now Sassau, USA. Uh, and so I do understand the issues with climate change. I do understand the issues uh, with also community uh, pollution as well. Those things must be mitigated. We must make sure that we're respecting and regarding those who have researched as well as those who we've invested in their education. It's essential. And Mr. Lulu, your thoughts on this? Do you have a plan? Okay. I'd like to start off by saying it's definitely a difficult aspect of dealing with something like climate change. There's so many variables. It's difficult to tell just what specifically the human impact of what's happening right now is. 
But again, my point goes back uh, once again to free markets. You'll probably hear me say this a lot during this uh, forum. What we're seeing is all these big industries, all these big oil companies, those sorts of things have significant government protections afforded to them repeatedly. There's a lot of anti-competitive legislation that gets passed in favor of those companies because obviously there's a lot of money transferred back and forth between politicians and those corporations. So what happens with that? You're squeezing out competition. You're stifling innovation. The key to progress and moving forward is innovation, letting people create. But you're creating these false financial barriers in these markets, keeping out the smaller players who just may threaten these bigger companies because, again, that's why they enjoy this legislation because it squeezes out all of the smaller competition to them. They make more money. They pass it along to the legislators who continue the cycle. And I believe that allowing the free market, which already was progressing in the environmentally responsible direction, to do its thing is the best method for this. Because, I mean, personally, I mean, I do advocate environmental responsibility as a choice. All right, let's switch gears now and talk about uh, another current event. Uh, Lafayette was put in the national spotlight this summer following the shooting death of Trayford Pellerin by Lafayette Police. Now, the case is still under investigation, but in these types of cases, qualified immunity is often cited as a reason why a police officer can't be held accountable when deadly force is used. Is it time to end this policy, this, this uh, policy of qualified immunity in cases like this? And what sort of reforms would you suggest to not only protect the community, but also protect police officers as well. Uh, Mr. Harris, we're back to you to start first with that. A absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, we want to send our regards to the family of Trey Propeller and, inform and all of those who have died in any way, shape, form, or fashion uh, to uh, police uh, brutality or anything along those lines as well. Uh, we want to make sure that we understand that I was at the funeral. Uh, I stood at the graveside with the mother. I've marched with the uh, protesters. I, I, I have felt what they are feeling just by being in that environment. But I also have been in the room uh, in Lake Charles multiple times, whether it was at the DA's office or at the, sheriff, uh, at, sheriff, at the Sheriff's Department or at the Lake Charles Police Department. I've been in the room uh, as we review tapes and we've watched policies and procedures. I've gone through a shooting scenario and understand the challenges and issues that are facing there. And we have a lot of conversation to have. It is much bigger than a 90 second uh, blurb that we want to be able to give. I will say this though, there is real change and real reform that is needed. Every community member knows it and every police officer knows it. Many of the policies and procedures are still in place from the 80s. Training is still in place from the 80s. Equipment that has now become more technologically advanced and non-lethal is not being purchased, is not being bought. Those are the things that we have to have conversations about and around. We have to make sure that we're providing the training and the education and they understand that that must be applied to equally across any community and everywhere. And so listen, I do understand uh, that we do have great challenges. Uh, in our community, uh, and we need to face those, and we have to do it in bigger pieces than sound bites and political PowerPoints. Mr. Lulu, over to you. All right, I'm glad you asked this question. This is something I spoke passionately about for a long time. You hear a lot, is it a few bad police officers, or is it most police officers are bad? It's irrelevant. The problem is we have a policing system that lends itself to corruption and abuse. Uh, you brought up qualified immunity. It's a perfect example. That's an, an incentive for officers to essentially be able to get away scot-free with any kind of brutality they want. It gets brushed under the rug. Police unions tend to add to these situations. Uh, I would like to see, first off, the end of qualified immunity we demilitarize the police and we end no-knock raids because all of those are absurd that they were ever allowed in the first place. Uh, you know, clearly we have to understand the police are not there to protect us, unfortunately. The Supreme Court has ruled this way multiple times. They are there to enforce the laws. They have no obligation to protect citizens. So this is a good way to begin addressing these issues, allow accountability, you know, allow the lawsuits and people to actually get fired and have a record 
whenever they commit these crimes and abuses. And so far, the only ones that are in Congress that are even brave enough to say anything or bring anything up have been Justin Amash and Rand Paul. Justin Amash started the unqualified immunity uh, piece of legislation. Rand Paul had the justice for Breonna Taylor. And guess where they went? Nowhere. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lulu. Mr. Anderson, over to you. I know it's a complicated issue. What are your thoughts? Uh, thank you for that question. And I will join the Reverend Harrison, starting with saying we, uh, we do pray for the family of uh, Trevor Pellerin. Um, and I also partially agree. You don't have to have a rebuttal because I agree with you. Uh, on, on We do need independence and in accountability. So I, I wanted to lead with those two things. Um, this is a complex issue because uh, a lot of times we don't get to talk about it. Um, there, this has been a Jim Crow era, this uh, the, uh, area, this state for a long time, and race relations need to improve, and then they bubble up every now and then. Where is it, is it uh, you know, law enforcement, there's good apples, there's bad apples, or is it the people? Um, and the answer is it's both. We do need, in my view, uh, an independent oversight for police reform. Criminal justice reform is critical. Um, one national issue, just pick off the top of my head because I like talking about it, is cannabis legalization. And the only reason we don't have it in this state is because of the Louisiana Sheriff's Association. So, for example, law enforcement is not necessarily on our side. They are there to enforce the law. So it is up, us to, up to us as the people to write just laws. We need, uh, you know, if we want economic justice, we have to have social justice first. And so, yes, I agree we need independent civilian oversight. My platform actually calls for playing, paying police officers more and actually holding them to standards. Wouldn't that be a great idea? With like a one-year training program instead of a six-week. So there are multiple ways to say, and as uh, Reverend Harris said, you can't do it in 90 seconds. So I apologize for that, but happy to talk about it more. Okay. On to question five now. I'd like to talk about civil discourse and politics don't always go together these days. The incumbent in this race threatened violence against a black militia in a Facebook post that was later removed by Facebook. That post was cited as one of the main reasons why the militia group, the NFAC, came to Lafayette. In your view, what is the role of a member of Congress in a situation like this, and how would you have addressed a similar scenario of civil unrest? Mr. Lula, you're up first. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, I generally, I don't like to speak out about opponents or anything like that. This one I did bring up uh, on my campaign page because I just am completely against the assertion of aggression in a situation where there was no immediate danger. And I believe that's wrong universally. If you're not uh, an immediate threat of your life or bodily harm, you have no right to make that kind of violent threat toward another person. That's just, like I said, in general, a universal thing I like to follow. Uh, and this is, you know, it's a, it's a complicated topic, too. Um, and I don't know, I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part of that? I, yeah, how would you address a case like this of civil unrest if you, would you post about it on Facebook? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, part of this whole unrest goes back to, you know, the police issues. We're not solving any kind of issues. We're just dancing about, uh, mm -hmm. not really addressing the issues at heart. We're talking about maybe touching symptoms, but we're not tackling the real problems. I mean, and when people have enough, this stuff starts to happen, unfortunately. And unfortunately, you know, it has led to violence and destruction of private property at some points. But again, the fault lies back that it's just nothing is really progressing because the current Congress apparently does not have much of a concern in pushing legislation forward. That would help. Uh, Mr. Anderson, over to you. And again, we're talking about that post that was removed by Facebook. Um, is What, in your view, is the role of a member of Congress in a situation like this? How would you have addressed it? Uh, thank you for that question, Jim. Uh, the short answer is not that. Pouring gasoline on a fire is a very bad look for a private citizen. For a public official to uh, deliberately poke a hornet's nest to cause civil unrest is not somebody who's interested in uniting this district in solving a problem. It is strictly to sow division or to appeal to a very uh, vile base. I'm not calling people vile, but 
I don't know what, who, who's, uh, who enjoyed that uh, post about threatening to drop any 10 of you where you stand. And yes, the NFAC, uh, and it's too bad that we're streaming that I can't say what those initials stand for, uh, the NFAC did respond directly to him and reached out to him. And he uh, denied that, they, that he apologized to them, said the whole thing never happened and never showed up at the rally. When, after calling them out, he didn't show up when they showed up, which again, uh, ended up being a peaceful protest. I think somebody dropped the firearm and it went off. I don't know all the details. But suddenly there was no violence. There was no unrest. This vague warning he'd issued of this other coming in, which of course was a photograph of a group of black armed men exercising their Second Amendment rights, and he posted against it. So I think I, we all know what his underlying message was. So don't do that. Mr. Harris, I saw you at that rally, at the NFAC rally. We, we spoke over there. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that post, and also how would you have addressed it? Let, let's be clear. Loose lips sink ships. Uh, and we cannot afford to have a congressman that cannot control his tongue. That's it, absolutely, especially in times where things are as sensitive as they are today, as well as the fact remains that you are disingenuous when you say we back the blue, but we kick them out front by starting fires that we don't intend to put out ourselves. And so I want to speak specifically to every um, young man, young woman that is in blue and say this, I will not get you into a fight that I will not come and stand with you in. I assure you that if I do not have no intentions of backing you up when the time is right, not just in rhetoric, but actual be there, as you mentioned, I was there uh, to, be, to be a part of that experience because I believe it's very difficult to build a bridge between two relationships if you don't have a relationship on both sides of the bridge. And so here's the things that I believe are important when it comes to things along those lines. We send ambassadors and diplomats all over the world to anchor, to broker peace with people we have nothing in common with. And so I believe there needs to be grant funding for when, uh, when cities and corporate, uh, cor corporations uh, and areas have their challenges where it comes to race relations, whether it's economics or whatever the case may be, where we can send diplomats, where we can send uh, 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 ambassadors into our interior cities to make sure that we can negotiate peace. Now here's the thing, people will say that it's not a government function, but here's the reality. That became national news. It became a, it became a national issue. And if something was to go wrong, there would be federal dollars spent to assist them in that process. And so we should do that right. when they need that help. Thank you, Mr. Harris. I want to turn now and talk about the pandemic. Louisiana has enacted a number of mitigation measures to try to stop the spread of COVID-19. These measures include a statewide lockdown at first and now a mask mandate. Have these measures gone far enough? Have they gone too far? What's your position? Mr. Anderson, you're up first. Uh, thank you for the uh, chance to address this. Uh, the short answer is everybody mishandled this virus since day one. Um, and now I'll give you the lengthier version. The federal government still, and it is October 22nd now, uh, and we first had uh, cases of the COVID-19 um, on our soil at the end of January, and we still don't have a national test and trace program, still, to this day. Uh, statewide, we reacted quickly, we overreacted, there was a mask mandate, and then the libertarians and myself, among those who defend the Constitution, did not like the sudden issuance that you must wear a mask and businesses must close down. So the governor, I understand, has a tough job. It's not a job I'd want at the state level, I'll say that right now. Um, you know, he had tough choices to make, and he made what I thought was best, and he issued a statement today that we are actually doing better than our southern neighbors. So know where they were, we're coming, I don't want to say we're coming out of the woods because we don't know what the reinfection rate is. And it has shown that, uh, you know, months after somebody has tested positive, they can uh, lose their antibodies and thus be susceptible to reinfection. So the truth is this is a novel virus. We have to listen to experts and go along the way. If we'd locked down for two weeks at the beginning and had contact tracing and isolated the individuals coming over from uh, China who were originally infected and from Europe, maybe we'd be in a different boat. Right now, we have to protect everybody while we're still figuring out what this virus actually is. 
Mr. Harris, your thoughts? Have the measures gone far enough or too far? You know, here's the deal. Uh, garbage in, garbage out is what my dad always taught me. And that means if you get bad information in, you're probably going to have a bad response. And here's what we do know. The president knew what was, go what was going on long before, that he, before he let the government as well as uh, governors know. And so it is very unfair to say that a, a governor or a, a state government or a local government made a bad decision because here's the reality. They made decisions based on bad information. And so what we have to do, specifically uh, when we get to Congress, is number one, one, the priority must be get the right information. We must begin to find out who's disseminating the wrong information, close those loopholes, and make sure that the right information is getting to our mm -hmm. state government and also down to our local government, and then encourage them and support them in making the tough decisions. Listen, we have just a little time. Uh, I believe if we're going to have a successful second quarter of 2021, then we have the first quarter of 2020 to make the very tough decisions that we need to make to ensure that we can have a successful year for the rest of the year. Because here's the thing, in, no, in September, we're going to be back in hurricane season. We need to have a successful second quarter. And Mr. Lolo, your thoughts on the COVID-19 mitigation measures? All right. Uh, honestly, I think the entire process and everything that has been done with this has been a complete disaster from day one. The CDC bungled it continuously, giving the public incorrect information over and over. First it was don't wear masks, then it was you have to wear masks, and it was a continuous mess. The FDA stifled any kind of innovation and progress towards treating and actually dealing with this. The shortage of the N or KN95 masks was a big issue at first, and guess what? It takes six to seven years to file a patent for a new medical device, so no one could design anything else similar because they're held back. I mean, who wants to wait six years to possibly have more masks? At that point, it doesn't matter. Anyway, and the data has continually shown these lockdowns have been terrible for the economy. It has been awful for people, individuals. We've had a massive uptick in suicides. It's just been a disaster all over the place. It has not helped in the slightest in the spread. We have a great control to look at, too, in Sweden. They didn't lock down anything. They kept business as usual for the most part, and their cases have dropped off the charts pretty much. It's uh, And us just following the recommendations from China and other countries like that just seems very bizarre and backwards. And again, I'm not a fan of mandated anything by the government. There were already businesses complying with these well before these regulations went into effect. All right, we're on to our next question. Mr. Harris, you're up first. Uh, also on the topic of COVID-19, once a vaccine is available, should it be free? Who should cover the cost? You know, here's the deal. I, I believe, in my personal opinion, that we must make sure that everyone gets vaccinated. And we've got to make it free. We've got to make it affordable. Uh, and so I think that's very, very important. I believe that my, my opinion and my personal uh, life is where there's great accountability. There's also great responsibility. And when we drop the ball, when government drops the ball, when they know things and they don't share it, uh, when we do not disseminate information as quickly and as honestly and as fairly as we possibly can, then I believe we must pick up that ball and take responsibility for that. And, and mitigate any damages that might be associated with it. And so, very, number one, we've got to make sure that it's a real vaccine. We've got to make sure that scientists and the data follows and that we make sure that it's something that is going to work and not be harmful, that even the, the non-vaxxers will have that trust and authority. And we have to reestablish authenticity and truth and transparency in government to ensure that even when we have it, whether it's free or not, people can trust the fact that their government is telling them the truth and not telling them that a mask is a bacteria trap or that it's going to go away when the sun shines in the summer. We have to make sure that free or not, we must make sure it's a real vaccine and that it is rolled out in a way that is transparent and is honest and that is real so that the trust of the American people can rely on it. Mr. Lulu. Okay. And you brought up a good point. How should it be paid for? Should it be right. paid for by the people or should it be free? Well, if it's free, in quotes, who's paying for it? Taxpayers are still paying for it. Uh, and what you do then is you have the government adopt one company's vaccine who has less incentive to make it great and usable, and then you're giving it out with taxpayer money. What I would like to see is several competing pharmaceutical companies 
working to develop these vaccines, and you know we have actual independent labs testing, doing trials that way. Because you know, as we all know, there's nothing in life is free. It has to come from somewhere, and we have spent record amounts of money as a government in the last couple months. Uh, you know, that is uh, one thing Trump has been bragging about a lot, and I'm not understanding why is the trillions of dollars we've just been throwing down the drain over the last few months, putting this country into now $27 trillion in debt. And, uh, yeah, again, I'm going to advocate, like I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I'm going to advocate for a free market solution would be the absolute best alternative. You have people who have profit incentives. You have competition, so they can't overprice it and gouge people. You have the quality that has to be there because a company's reputation is staked on that. And, I mean, you're going to come up with a faster and better option that way. Mr. Anderson. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, once again, I'm in the third position, so both the elements of both of the answers I agree with. Uh, first and foremost, yes, we have to uh, make sure it is a safe vaccine so that we are even all talking about the same things. Now, one thing we're all kind of skirting around up here, but which is obvious to everybody in the United States, is we're in the middle of the gaslighting era. There is no true focused flow of information anymore. There's multiple sources, social media. People tell us that 5G causes cancer or they're going to put a chip in your blood. And this is the reality of 2020. We, we are in an era where there are multiple competing information and our, and our own, uh, you know, the federal administration is not immune from that. Um, so there is a lot of disinformation happening. And, and there are multiple entities around the world working to make this vaccine, uh, by the way. So in, in that way, I agree. In a free market, Yes, we absolutely need competition to drive it out. But however, logic dictates that since we are the United States and we're not just going to let, you know, leper colonies form in the corner, that everybody should have access to the vaccine, which means since we do have very poor and we have the homeless all the way up to the wealthy, that everybody should just get the vaccine and it should be free. I'll go on record right now and say it should be free. It's an investment into the people. We're trying to stop out COVID-19. We're not trying to decide who's the next member of Congress. So I agree that everybody needs a safe vaccine. They need it as rapidly as we can get it and as safely as we can get it. And it should be done like they did the polio program in the 70s, where I was the last gener you know, we got the shot. It's cool. On to our next question. This also concerning the pandemic, but the economic recovery. Mr. Lolo, this goes to you first. Uh, would you support a second round of stimulus payments? What, in your view, does a bipartisan agreement on the issue look like? Okay, well, first, I feel like Congress has made it pretty clear that a bipartisan consensus on this is going to be a surface, to say the least. They are both withholding it like it's some kind of a carrot on a stick for the people. Secondly, I do not support it. Uh, I believe it's a terrible idea whenever we've already had 22% of all U.S. dollars ever created were created this year. That is a massive amount of inflation. If you're familiar with the basics of economics, when you have a resource in a market system and you multiply that resource, that resource becomes less scarce, therefore less valuable. That is what is currently happening to our dollar. We have had the chairman of the Federal Reserve actually come out and say, we are in for some serious inflation after this year. That is a scary thing because if you know anything about the Fed, they are very, in the name, reserved and private about all of their information. And I don't see just printing more money and handing it out as a good thing. I see it as a terrible thing in order to set back anyone who has money saved, set aside, is going to immediately become worth less. Mr. Anderson, would you support a second round of stimulus payments? What does a compromise on the issue look like? Uh, well, the compromise would be apparently doing anything. Uh, the House has uh, passed the CARES Act, I believe it was in May, and it's been sitting on uh, Senate Majority Leader McConnell's desk ever since. And both sides accuse the other of trying to stack it with pork. The Democrats are trying to get stimulus checks to the people and PPP loans to small businesses, and McConnell uh, apparently wants more tanks and bombers and whatever else. It's, there is no partisan cooperation right now. Uh, for us to pretend otherwise is, is uh, absurd uh, because we can see the national politics. Nothing goes through without 
uh, Republican majority approval in the Senate, no matter what the House passes. So, yes, the House should pass a stimulus bill. The Senate should pass a stimulus bill to answer the question as it stands today. Uh, the reason being that money uh, doesn't go to sit in bank accounts and devalue, not to argue with you, but, you know, you're the last one I hear. I'm sorry, I just keep picking on you. <laughs> If you switch positions, I'll pick on Mr. Harris next. Um, 30 seconds left. I got it. The, uh, we do need a stimulus because that money doesn't go into a mattress. It goes right back into rent. It goes into local businesses. It goes into stores. If I get money, I don't, I don't have you know, a Panamanian bank account or whatever wealthy people do with it. I put it back into my community, pay my bills, you know, buy a new tractor if I had the money, that type of stuff. That's what that money does. It gets into the community. It keeps the economy afloat and actually helps small businesses. And Mr. Harris, your thoughts on a second round of stimulus? Absolutely. I think this is very important, a uh, very important conversation and topic, and it also uh, distinguishes me uh, as a moderate and why we need more moderates in the U.S. Congress. It's very, very essential in moments like these to be able to cross party lines and get the job done. It is very clear that partisan politics has taken, uh, has debilitated our government from even being able to assist the American people in such a crisis such as this. We know those dollars are needed. I can tell you where they're needed most. They're needed most right here in southwest Louisiana and south central Louisiana as people are not only struggling from the pandemic, but they're also struggling from two hurricanes. I can tell you who else needs it. Someone who is evacuated in New Orleans, someone who is evacuated in Houston, someone is in evacuated in Dallas. Those funds could immediately assist them in getting back up on their feet, be able to assist them in getting back home, specifically to be able to even put gas in a car or buy a bus ticket home to vote for this election. It's essential that we have moderates that can make things happen and get the job done. And that's why I'm proud to be a moderate and willing and ready and have a track record of working with anyone and everyone to get the job done for people. All right, we'll move on to our final general question, uh, also on the topic of the pandemic uh, and the economy. You know, the impacts are, are, are really throughout the economy, economy, from oil and gas to hospitality and service industries. What would you do to promote economic growth within the third congressional district amid the pandemic? Mr. Anderson, this goes to you first. Oh, that's good. It's right in my sweet spot. Reinvest in the district. Uh, we have for a long time, uh, under Reagan, as a matter of fact, is when it started, started talking about replacing the I-10 I Calcasieu River Bridge. That it, those talks actually came up. That bridge actually aged out at the end of the Reagan administration. And here, 40-something uh, years later, almost 40 years later, excuse me, uh, it's still a political football. Everybody who gets up in my position says, I'm going to bring you a new I-10 bridge and uh, hopefully we're all wise enough to actually not promise that. However, what we do need to do is replace the I-10 and got to River Bridge because that creates jobs. We need to uh, bring public Wi-Fi to the third district. One, that creates jobs. And two, it makes sure that rural kids and poorer kids have access to do homeschooling where right now we're finding is a real need during a pandemic. We're finding out that the 21st century isn't just having clean air and water, although we do need that as well, and that's also part of the, the plan. But we need that everybody to be on the same page technologically. It's an investment into ourselves. Here in Lafayette, we had LUS Fiber was a model of, uh, you know, government-sponsored industry, infrastructure, basically, uh, done by the university, and it was so good they tried to privatize it afterwards. So we can invest in ourselves, and it does become a reward for the people of this district. Mr. Harris, over to you. How do we rebound? Absolutely. Well, we have a plan that we're going to be laying out very soon called the 321, moving District 3 to the oneness, to unity, and creating a super region where we move from a place of competition to cooperation, where we're able to lay over a master plan. I believe that's one of the essential uh, resources that the Congressional Office can provide is the resources and the funding to lay out a master plan for the entire district, looking at each and every city's ability, their strengths, their weaknesses, their opportunities and threats, matching those up and meshing those in with the cities that are nearest and dearest to them, as well as being a conduit of communication where cities that are, have like populations and like issues are able to come together, share those ideas, and share how they're making it work. There's no reason a city like Sulphur can't share ideas with St. Martinsville, New Iberia, or Abbeville. There's no reason that Lake Charles and Lafayette should be one is feast, the other is famine, or vice versa. And we've seen that over the last few decades, and we have to move past the point of competing with one another and 
re realize that our destinies are tied together here in District 3, and there must be a master plan that takes into accountability everyone's assets in order to be able to utilize them in the best way possible to ensure the prosperity of the entire region. And so it's together that we are able to get that done through cooperation and no more competition between the region, creating super regions both economically, educationally, and all of those things, ensuring that we're on one page and utilizing and maximizing everyone's benefits, assets. And to you, Mr. Lulu. All right, and also to address one of Mr. Anderson's concerns, uh, the I-10 bridge, like he said, it does get thrown around, lots of promises are made around it. I actually do have a specific plan that I've borrowed from a very brilliant gentleman named Larry Sharp, uh, and he came up with this idea, and it's just a great moderate meeting ground for things. Corporate sponsorship for those sorts of things. You allow a corporation to sponsor it, keep up the maintenance, they're responsible for a lot of that stuff. You work out the fine details in the contract and you have a either significantly less tax burden or almost no tax burden to fix that. Um, anyway, so, I'm sorry, I, what was the question again? We were talking about economic recovery. Oh yeah, the economic recovery. Okay, yes. And my idea with this too is kind of, again, what Mr. Anderson said, uh, reinvesting in the area. I think is critical. That's what any brilliant business owners do is they reinvest in their companies and corporations. Uh, you know, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, he gets a lot of heat, but he's famous for doing this, reinvesting. Because the left tends to look at the economy through jobs, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, spending. The right tends to look at the economy in a job aspect, but really the most important aspect of an economy that makes everyone's life better is productivity. So progression, innovation, that increases productivity is what increases the standard of living for everyone. Okay, very good. Let's move on now, everybody, to our lightning round questions. We have about 11 or so questions. Real quick answer, yes or no in most cases, um, but we'll kind of go through. Everybody have a chance to answer each of those questions. Um, first up, Mr. Harris, would you support a nationwide mask mandate? A nationwide mask mandate? Um, great question. No, I don't believe I support a nationwide mask mandate, but I wouldn't support nationwide truth telling. Mr. Lulu? Yeah, that's going to be a no from me as well. That's the same as saying what you can wear every day. Mr. Anderson? Uh, in my, is it an opinion or legislation? Would you support the legislation? No. Okay. Uh, what should be the federal minimum wage in your view? Mr. Lulu, you're up first. All right. As you can probably guess, again, I'm a free market advocate. I am not a fan of central planning and a blanket minimum wage over the entire country due to the various differences in economies. Mr. Anderson? I, I do believe in it a more uh, regionally scaled. In Louisiana, factoring the cost of living, the minimum wage should be around $12 an hour. So I agree. It should be done regionally, given the cost of living, uh, as well as cost uh, of, of, of rental and things along those lines. And so it should be done at the local uh, local regional level. Like the so press you on that. What should it be here in Louisiana? Say again? What should it be here in Louisiana? $12 to $15. Mr. Anderson? Oh, I stand by 12. Absolutely. <laughs> that should be a contract worked out between worker and employer. All right. Uh, we're back to starting over with Mr. Anderson. Should the Supreme Court be expanded? Mm, that's a loaded question. I'm going to do it in context. Currently, right now, this very minute, no. Mr. Harris? No. No. Mr. Lulu? Uh, no, I'm not a fan of the idea of making it larger. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Harris, you're back up first. Would you support voting by mail? Yes. Voting by mail? Uh, as a USPS customer, I'm going to say no to that. Uh, uh, yes, I'm a big proponent of voting by mail. I voted in person, but I absolutely support and would ex support an expanse of voting by mail. It's been shown to be trouble-free. There's entire states that are built by mail only, and they uh, haven't had problems. Similar question, Mr. Lillard, I'll start with you. Uh, should voting by mail be universal during the pandemic? I'm still going to say I would prefer to see a secure, maybe blockchain-oriented voting process digitally as opposed to mail. I just have had too many negative experiences myself. I'm sorry, what was the actual question? We're asking if you would support voting by mail for everybody with the pandemic. I support that they have the right to do so, but I wouldn't uh, support making them do 
you said no. And Mr. Harris? Yeah, I would support the right to do it as well, but I do want to add on to Mr. Lalu. I you see no reason why we cannot innovatively build a system where we do all of our banking on our phone, but we cannot vote on our phone as well. We can do biometrics and many other ideas as well. So I think we should make voting as accessible and as easy as possible for every single American. Yes. All right, final lightning round question. Uh, who are you supporting for president? Oh, great question. That's a great question. Um, I am supporting the Biden um, as well as uh, Kamala Dickett. Mr. Lula? All right. I'm not a fan of blind party allegiance, but I am going to support Joe Jorgensen because I believe in her stance on war and economic reform. And Mr. Anderson? Uh, considering the district we're in, I almost refused to answer, but I did already vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. All right. Uh, we're up uh, against the clock here, so it's time for closing statements, everybody. Mr. Anderson, I'll start at the end with you. You have 30 seconds. Okay, I'll keep it brief. My name is Rob Anderson. I came for the working class, so I still am for the uh, working class, unless I said from. Did I say from or for? doesn't matter. Um, the policies are out there. We have a plan to rebuild Louisiana. It's called the Cajun Act, and I'll do a press release on it because I couldn't do it here. Clean air and Network Utilities Act, or Utilities and Networks Act, sorry, Cajun Act. Jobs, Utilities, and Network. And I blew the release on live TV. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, vote if you haven't for me already on November 3rd. Mr. Lulu? All right, again, my name is Brandon Lulu. Uh, I would like to wrap up saying that I am a proponent for all the individuals out there in District 3. I want to represent each one of you as a person. You're not a group or a collective to me. I value you and your liberty higher than anything. I want to reduce the size and scale and scope of our government, which is the largest to ever exist in history. And I really hope that you trust me to represent you and really rein in the government and protect your rights. And Mr. Harris. Absolutely. Again, my name is Braylon Harris. I'm number 26 on your ballot, and I look to replace Mr. Clay Higgins as your new U.S. representative because I believe there's one job that must be done, and that is to ensure that we are forming a more perfect union. I do not know how you do that if you are not moderate enough to reach across both aisles and ensure that the job gets done. We have real work to do right here at home. We have to make sure that we have someone that can articulate our values to Congress and be an ambassador for our recovery. I encourage you to look beyond the rhetoric, check the resources as well as our resumes and ensure that we've done the work that we say we're going to do. All right, gentlemen, I thank you very much. This concludes our third congressional district forum. I again want to thank Braylon Harris, Brandon Lulu, and Rob Anderson for taking part in this forum. I think it's really important for the voters out there. A reminder, everybody, early voting continues through every day through next Tuesday, except on Sunday. The early voting hours are 8 until 7, and on Election Day, voting runs from 6 until 8. Now, if you missed any part of this program tonight, you can watch it again over on KETC.com, and AOC will also be replaying this as well. We'll keep you posted on that. I want to thank our co-sponsors, AOC, the Acadiana Center for the Arts, and UL's College of Liberal Arts for helping us put this on, as well as the crew here in the Moncus Theater here at the ACA. And for those of you watching live, don't go anywhere. The presidential debate, the final debate, is coming up next. I'm Jim Hummel. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Tonight's forum was presented by the University of Louisiana at Lafayette's College of Liberal Arts, AOC Community Media, the Acadiana Center for the Arts, and KATC TV3.